Welcome to the Biohackers podcast. My name is Teemu Arena. I'm your host. And today's guest is Professor Russell Hansen from uh, um, uh, Mount Sinai. And he's the CEO of Brain Backup. And he's been looki- looking at how to map the brain and how can we make a digital copy almost of the human brain. And last year at the Biohackers Summit, we had Max Moore and he's been working on cryogenics so putting pe- people into cryo preservation with the idea of treating people with terminal uh, kind of that once you have a terminal illness the uh, cryo preservation is a treatment for uh, the terminal condition basically if t- today's modern medicine can't uh, save you we can freeze you up and maybe return you back to life later in life. Now, making a copy of your connectome, which Professor Russell Hansen will be discussing in a moment, is another way to preserve what's in here. And uh, we're going to be diving deep into the brain and if it's possible to make that copy and if it's possible maybe in the future to restore that, uh, let's say in a digital format on a, in a physical body, and what that would, would entail. So welcome to the show, uh, Professor. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, it's really nice to chat about the Connectome um, with the biohacker audience. I guess I, I consider myself a, a, a biohacker, and I used to be a, a computer hacker going to like DEF CON and the Chaos Computer con- Convention and in Germany and other hacker conferences. So it's, it's nice to that you've provided this biohacker summit. Right on. It's uh, what I find interesting is Aub- that Aubrey de Grey, who is uh, basically at the Sense Foundation looking at human longevity, and he thinks that aging is a disease that can be cured. And his background is also in computer science. So what's going on here? Why do people with computer science background, uh, why are they interested in, in, in life extension and longevity? Well, I think everybody has their own reason. Um, I think for me personally, I uh, I started off as a physicist actually, so I trained as a physicist. And um, uh, in the the early 2000s, there was a huge interest in um, gene sequencing, and so I got into biology through um, the Human Genome Project and went to graduate school doing um, gene sequencing, and I'm still doing gene sequencing now in the genetics department at Mount Sinai. So I think that basically, at least for me, um, I just, I didn't really see what the application was in, in physics to really continue. Whereas, you know, every day we, it seems there's a new amazing discovery or therapy in, in biology and it just seemed so much more interesting to me. Uh, tell me one thing. So when looking at, um, when, when looking at the, the genome and looking at the brain, uh, right now the sort of dominating metaphor uh, for the brain is the computer metaphor. So processing information, storing information, uh, input process, output, etc. Uh, is, is that like exactly accurate? Can we describe the human brain as, uh, as we are describing a computer? Um. I think that it sort of depends who you're talking to. Um, I think that there are so many different ways that you know computer scientists and mathematicians can model systems that it would be, I don't think it's accurate to say that there's no way that a computer scientist or an applied mathematician cannot model the brain. So I would say, um, I would say it's accurate. I think that there, there's sort of a, a data gap right now between what would be needed to make an accurate model of the brain um, and the current um, data that's available. And so that's what me and many other people are working on is um, generating the data, making technologies to make the data um, full enough that we can make uh, an accurate model of the brain um, at the biological and cellular and kind of information flow level. What I find interesting is that in the past, in during Descartes time, we were describing or he was describing the brain as kind of like it's operating through hydraulic pumps. Uh, and th- that was the metaphor during that time. And, and later on in the Industrial Revolution, there was the ideas that 
in the human body there are kind of like cogs or gears and machinery going on and, and now we have the computation paradigm uh, that we that we use to describe uh, what's going on and um, kind of like I, I really like the book from Jaron Lanier who was one of the pioneers of virtual reality and augmented reality and, and he recently wrote a book called uh, I'm not a gadget where he's making the case that biological systems and, and uh, analog systems, uh, when you make a digital representation of them, uh, you are losing something. So can we accurately transcode what is going on in a biological process and make a replica of that in, a, in, in current like information domain? Um, I believe so. I, I haven't read the book that you're referring to. Um, there, there are many people who have many different uh, opinions on this, and I think that their opinions usually are just based on what is it that they believe is the most fundamental piece of information. So for me and my colleagues, what we believe is the most fundamental piece of information is uh, the chemical information, and to some extent the the electrical information or the electron flow. So the, the way that we break it up is we break it up into the chemical information being things like proteins and ions and neurotransmitters and the electrical information or the, the current flow or the ion flow um, through axons that makes uh, what we call electrophysiology. So the, uh, the way that neurons spike much. So there are two types of cells that spike. Heart cells have these electrical spikes and neurons have these electrical spikes. Um, and you've, you've certainly seen, you know, the, the way that uh, the heart pumps and, you know, the heartbeat is, is an electrical spiking process. Um, <clears throat> right. So the, uh, so what we believe is that the foundational information is the chemical information. And so the people that uh, I work with and the people who um, in my lab, we, we're, we're all experts in chemicals and measuring chemicals in, in interesting ways. Um, so the way we measure those chemicals is by bouncing other particles off of them, almost the way that a particle physicist would, would hit two particles together to see what the result of the particle collision is. What we do is we, we bounce particles off neurons and proteins and we see um, where they are and what their their structure is. So I think that one of the, the analogies that I found very useful in kind of understanding the connectome and, you know, deciphering the brain is that if you put someone under a deep sedation uh, for surgery, um, most of the electrical uh, activity in their brain stops. So, you know, the, uh, the electrical activity stops, but when they wake up, they're still certainly themselves. So they, they, they've they lost maybe 15 to 20 minutes of their short-term memory, which is what's encoded in all these electrical impulses that are shooting around your brain, but um, they still have their long-term memories. So the long-term memories are encoded in these uh, relatively slowly changing um, proteins. Um, usually they're proteins at the synapse. And so, um, you know, to say that we can't image the brain because it's always um, in a state of flux is, is true, but it, it doesn't take into account that we can actually separate the very fast processes, these electrical processes from these very slow processes, the, the chemicals um, such as the proteins and the, the cells themselves. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay losing 15 to 20 minutes um, because I, you know, the long-term stuff is what everyone really cares about anyway. Another question that I that I want to pose is, when you sleep, what you have learned throughout the day is encoded into long-term memory um, in the REM sleep phase. So is that basically where you are taking the electric activity and, and there is some physical changes in the connectome? Um, to, to be clear, we're not really interested in measuring the electrical information as much as we are the uh, chemical information. So to to us, the connectome is not electrical information. It's chemical long-term information that is, you know, more or less static over a period of 30 to 60 minutes. Um, I think another interesting uh, area for for your listeners would actually be this uh, a next generation neural interface. So neural interfaces or brain machine interfaces are these ways of interacting, usually with the brain through the electrical impulses. Um, and so the DARPA in the United States, which is uh, 
funded the, the creation of the internet back in the late 70s, early 80s, is starting a new project right now that we're involved with called NESDI, or um, Neural Information Systems Design. Um, and what they're doing is we're, uh, they're putting out about a $60 million grant to do um, what we've called a, a neural modem. And so what it is is it, it um, stimulates 100,000 neurons and reads from a million neurons. And current technologies to read from neurons on the electrical scale are, let's say, from, from 50 to a couple hundred um, electrical signals. So to go from 100 to a million is really a, a huge advance. And um, the goal of this DARPA program is to do this uh, this project in the next three to four years and have a um, an implant that's available in humans that uh, can interface with motor cortex, visual cortex, auditory cortex um, with extremely high resolution. Um, and that could almost allow for lack of a better term, we could call it telepathic communication. So basically, very, very um, high resolution interfacing directly with the, the cortex. Elon Musk is, uh, is is working on the neural lace. Is is it related to the same same kind of domain? Uh, could you remind me what the neural lace is that you've heard of? The neural lace is some kind of uh, uh, computational implant that is uh, physically attached to the brain that can uh, interface with the internet, for example. So that when you're referring to telepathic um, communication, uh, the, the basic idea would be that in long term, uh, I'm just thinking of something and it could be transmitted and uh, I could also receive information um, that is generated uh, through this neural lace uh, in terms of electric activity in the brain. This is at least how I understand it. Yeah, I, I think I, I know what you mean. I, I'm not aware of any actual product that has been proposed for the neural lace. Um, there are many, uh, maybe you've heard of the company called Kernel, which was um, started recently. Have you heard of Kernel? No, I haven't. Please uh, give so, a short summary. Okay, so um, in the last couple of weeks, there was a, a very, um, to us, innovative company called Kernel that was found uh, funded to the tune of $100 million um, to make an implantable CPU in the human brain. And um, this is profoundly uh, forward-thinking um, because there's there's currently very little that, that is possible to do um, in terms of implanting a CPU in, in the brain of even a mouse or a rat or a monkey. So to say that you are doing a company that makes neural implants that implant CPUs in the human brain is, it's a little bit um, forward thinking. To, um, but at the same time, it's its really fascinating. So they're they are using the same paradigm that we're, that we're using, but you know, 15 years ago, it was unthinkable that uh, we could sequence the genome for a thousand dollars. You know, everybody thought it would take a billion dollars and years of people's time to do the, the genome sequencing. And in the end, it really was a, very, a rather small team that, that was able to put together the technologies to do the, the genome sequencing. So much like the genome sequence um, has become something that, you know, on the floor of the building I'm, I'm in now, we sequence uh, hundreds of people a week. Um, in the future, you know, using whatever people come up with, um, it'll be possible to sequence connectomes for hopefully a similar price, you know, maybe something like $1,000. Um, there are many technical challenges to be solved, but there were many technical challenges to be solved with the genome as well. Right, right. So, so this kind of accelerating uh, ex technological change that Ray Kurzweil refers to, um, also technological singularity or um, just the expo exponential technologies Peter Diamond is one of his co-founders at Singularity University. was in Finland recently, and I had a, I had the opportunity to have a chat with him. And uh, uh, he's working with Greg Venter, who, I, if I uh, if I remember correctly, was the first one to sequence the human genome. And uh, he has this company, Human Longevity Inc. And what they're planning to do is to kind of take uh, the, the take your genome, take your metabolomics, take your MRI. 
uh, etc. And, and all these different domains and then input those in the machinery and, and to be processed through machine learning. And uh, uh, they aim, aim to figure out like how to how to expand human lifespans. And he calls this uh, moonshot project, one of his moonshot projects. Um, so so um, how would you kind of describe where we are right now? Uh, uh, you have now one thousand dollars to to sequence the genome. I've done that with Twenty Three and Me. Uh, I know that it's not the full genome; uh, it's a it's a it's a fraction of that. But um, it's available. Uh, I could even just buy that for a few a couple of thousand right now, and, uh, and and get that genome. Now now I can also analyze my microbiome that was not possible um, for consumers until recently. And uh, not long time ago, there was only like one person in the world who, who, who had his uh, microbiome fully analyzed. So it seems to me that we are, we are going extremely fast to the future and new opportunities are opening up. And you are now talking about connectome, that we can also map the neural um, connections uh, in the brain. So, so when you think of putting all these pieces together, um, the electric activity in the human nervous system, looking at the genetics, looking at um, the, the genetical code in, our bac in the bacteria that lives in our bodies, the microbiome, um, the, the skin biome, etc., and all these interactive relations that they have together. So um, how is that going to solve the problems that we have today in healthcare or uh, things related to human longevity? Uh, or, or is it really just to augment human capabilities to, um, um, to even take them beyond what it means to be human? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's a question that everybody, um, that, many, that many people are fascinated with, including myself and, and um, and perhaps you. Um, uh, I think that what we're seeing with this kind of data revolution in the, the microbiome and the connectome and the genome uh, is, is really, uh, it's both technical and scientific and it's also sort of humanistic, you know, people want to understand themselves better. And it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing that um, so many methods have been developed uh, that allows people to to sequence their to get their snips of their genomes from 23andMe for a few hundred bucks. I also got my 23andMe. Um, uh, 23andMe is only maybe 600,000 probes out of the three billion in the human genome, so it's a much reduced set of of coverage. Um, I'm not I'm not an expert in longevity or um, you know anti aging, so I, I don't think that I'm really qualified to comment on all the things that are happening in that field. I, I would I would say that from my perspective as a as someone who works in genetics, that um, the more we know, the more we will be able to address the problems that arise as, as people age. And I think that um, and that it's it's certainly accelerating and. Um, it's becoming a, a very technical field of sort of understanding all these changes that, that occur and, and doing something about them. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of what precision medicine is about. One could say that precision medicine or personalized medicine are actually, you know, really the same thing as longevity or, you know, by, by addressing the personal issues that are happening in people's um, aging or sickness, we're actually um, working to make them live longer. So it's, you know, I, I think that humans are uh, destined to find tools to, to make them live better and healthier, and I don't see any problem with that. All right. So you are working on brain backups, and right now, if I want to map out what's going on in my brain, if I understood correctly, most of the techniques that we've used in the past are destructive in nature. So I need to slice up the brain and uh, look at each slice and, and uh, in that way map out what's going on there. Now we can use brain imaging technologies, and, um, and you may want to refer where we are in terms of that technology um, to map that out in a, in a non-destructive way. Um, can you explain us uh, what's the state of the art? Where, where are we in terms of 
brain imaging and mapping out the connectome um, in a non-invasive way. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thanks for asking. Um, that, that is indeed the whole um, impetus behind brain backups was that we were very frustrated with the fact that um, in order to get the kind of resolution that's needed for a full connectome, you have to um, use dead tissue, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's a destructive process. So what you do is you, you take a, a dead brain, you, you treat it with some chemicals that make it more um, amenable to, to imaging. Um, one particular chemical that we use is called osmium tetroxide, which is a electron microscope staining agent. And then you slice the brain very thin and you image it on an optical microscope or an electron microscope. So, you know, I, I felt like this was very uh, disappointing that, you know, in order to image the thing that you want to image, you have to destroy it. You know, why would you want to destroy the thing you want to image? It seems uh, inherently wasteful and destructive. Um, so, so, you know, if you're using electron microscopes or optical microscopes, you, you will destroy your sample um, and most likely if the, the organism isn't already dead, you will kill it. Um, and of, of course, you know, with people, that's that's not going to happen. It's 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 unethical, and it, it simply will never happen. So, um, so then when you when you move from these uh, destructive methods over to non-destructive methods, um, the sets of tools that we have right right now are things like MRI, which use big magnets. Um, another imaging method is called PET or positron emission tomography, where you can see you you in, inject this contrast agent. And the contrast agent um, will show you things like where dopamine is or other different types of neurotransmitters. And then the third kind of non-destructive technique that's commonly used is called uh, computer tomography, which is x-rays. And yet a fourth might be um, near-infrared. So, so between magnets, positrons, and different wavelengths of photons, um, you're left you have a, a huge variety of ways that you can image non-destructively and non-invasively through through the skull. So the skull and the water are really the things that get in the way. Um, if you uh, if you try to transmit radio waves from a submarine, um, the water stops um, many of the uh, the radio waves because of just the nature of water. It just absorbs um, radio waves really well. Um, <clears throat> Sorry if this is getting a little bit technical, but all, all these right. different imaging methods are are really uh, important. Um, I think the fifth one is actually um, pressure waves, so kind of like sonar. Um, so th right now there's many people who believe that, that pressure waves or sonar actually have the needed um, resolution to image the brain at the submillimeter scale. So... The fire alarm has gone off in my building. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, yes, I, <laughs> I hope it's not a drill. Hopefully. All right, it already stopped. Um, right, so the, the challenge then is to get submillimeter. So with, with MRI right now, you can image uh, a millimeter, a couple of millimeters, um, but that's just not good enough for detailed connectivity of the neurons. So what we... Our goal is to image at the, the micron scale in vivo. And so that's three orders of magnitude, a thousand times higher resolution. And uh, we have some CT machines, so these X-ray machines right now, that can image at about um, 300 nanometers, so sub half a micron. That is to say, you know, basically the, the scale we want. Um, the trouble with X-rays is that they actually cause ionizing radiation, which can cause your, um, yeah, you know, damage. the water... The waters break apart. The, they cause DNA damage. If there's damage on both strands of the the DNA, then uh, DNA repair can't can't function, and then you have a mutation that is persistent, and that's that's a big problem because it causes cancer. So, so the struggle right now with with non-destructive, non-invasive imaging is kind of balancing all of these different um, factors together, from the radiation or the ionizing radiation of X-rays to um, making a, a sonar sensor or transducer that's sensitive enough um, 
maybe you need to actually do some kind of surgery and open the skull and put a transducer underneath the skull because the skull blocks many of the pressure waves. Uh, maybe you need to put a near infrared, which is a you know, infrared actually can pass through up to 10 centimeters of tissue and also skull. Um, but the trouble is, is that it's actually very, um, the resolution isn't very good. It's like looking through a very, very dense fog. You know, you can mm. see kind of, <laughs> you've certainly looked through the fog, you know, you like can I'm kind of- trying to look through the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So basically putting something in the brain that helps the imaging process. Yes. And so what we are working on is uh, in this, in for, for CT imaging, um, we're interested in contrast agents. So for Contrast agents allow you to image more of the subtypes of neurons, um, the physiology of the neuron, the biophysiology, say the neurochemistry of the neuron. So basically by putting a piece of a chemical in the brain that responds to x-rays, you can actually see more than you could without it. Because, you know, just like when you get an x-ray of your arm, you know, you mostly see the, the bone because the bone has calcium and the x-rays bounce off of the calcium. So you can use calcium as a contrast agent. So what we do is we, we put things like gold or iron or calcium or potassium, which are these contrast agents that the, the x-rays bounce off of, and then we can more precisely image what, what we need to. Gotcha. So I'm going to have a golden brain in the future. So, so what's the implication of this? So, so I, I will be then able to, that, or we could be able to get a more clear picture with less fog on what's going on in your brain in terms of a connector. Now, let's assume we can make that copy um, and we have that stored somewhere. Uh, what can we do with it? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, I, for fear of going back to the genome analogy, um, you know, right now we can uh, get these full genomes of people, but you know, it's the analysis that's really troubling. And so, what people do um, in these genome studies is they take two thousand people who have a disease and two thousand people see what's different in the, the the sick people. You know, whether they have prostate cancer or brain cancer or lung cancer. And so, I think that what's going to happen and what is already happening is that you'll get these case control um, studies of, of connectomes of, of brains. It's already happening with MRI. So in MRI, of course, there are many, many um, studies of what, what section of the brain lights up when you do arithmetic or when you do language processing. And as new and better methods to image the brain, you know, the scientists will do their, their analysis of, you know, what, what part of the brain is involved and what, um, what what types of connectivities are involved in dementia or Alzheimer's or other um, schizophrenia? You know, basically studying of diseases and how right. So um, so mapping but, different types of brains one one with Alzheimer's disease and the damage that is involved, uh, one of a developing brain of a young child, one of a uh, one of an adult, one of a elderly uh, elderly person, and then mapping out what aging does, what different disease does, uh, and uh, basically running a simulation and analysis on, on computers uh, then with the copy that we have, copies that we have. Uh, do we have a connectome already? So is, is, is it still like a holy grail that is being searched for? Is it, is, has it been mapped? Uh, so where are we? Yeah, there are a couple of connectomes that have been published. Um, the most commonly cited one is the, the smallest one and the most complete connectome, which was of this um, the flatworm, the C. elegans worm. So the flatworm, the C. elegans worm, has 302 neurons, and you know anyone can download it um, from the internet right now. Um, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet where every neuron is on every line, and it's connected to, you know, neuron one is connected to neuron two, and you know, neuron one is a, an acetylcholine receptor or, or whatever. Uh, receiving neuron um, and as you as you move up in complexity through different brain sizes you get to you know um, the, the the fruit fly so the fruit fly is another very commonly studied uh, organism in biology and and there are there are some partial connectomes of the fruit fly and then you know as you go up to you know from the mouse to the fly to the 
sorry, to, <laughs> from the worm to the fly, then you get to the mouse and the rat. And so we mostly use uh, mice and rats um, as, a, as, a, as a small, simple mammalian brain. And, um, and there, are, there are sections of the brain uh, for which the connectomes have been somewhat mapped in small, uh, in, all right, <laughs> I forgot one. So another big one is the octopus. So the octopus has a brain that has very huge neurons. And so mapping neurons in an octopus is actually relatively easy. So in fish and, and octopuses, um, it's, it's not that hard because the neurons are just huge in, in many cases. Um, right. so, so, so basically because of the resolution that we don't have yet, uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we have been successful in mapping the brains that have larger neurons that you can actually see more clearly. Is that right? Yes, precisely. Um, and and, and when, we, when we go to mammalians, I mean, we have partial. Uh, so, so does it mean that we don't have a scanner yet that can go through the whole thing, or it's just just so difficult right now to get the resolution? The the way that people like to do connectom connectomics in mammalian brains is using um, electron microscopes, and these electron microscopes are very expensive to run and very slow. And so there have been maybe a cubic millimeter of brain. It, the number is always changing, but we could say, let's say a cubic centimeter of human brain has been mapped at the EM level. Um, there are groups um, at the ETH Zurich and uh, at Harvard University um, where very, very small volumes of human brain have been mapped. And um, and what you have to do is you, you do these the slicing images um, using an electron microscope, and then you stack up the slices again, and then use a computer program to trace out all the different um, cell bodies in there. And so very, very small volumes, you know, on the order of a, a cubic centimeter have been mapped with, I would say, every cell in that volume. And so many groups have been, have been looking at ways to automate the process of uh, doing EM or electron microscope uh, imaging it at just much faster and more cheaply. And so they make robots that take the slices of brain and move them over to the microscope and image them and basically just do, have a robot do the whole process. And so the the goal of any of, of some of these robots is that sometime in the future you could have a warehouse full of, of brains you know, of people who have died of natural causes and, you know, you just let the robots do the whole scanning process and you let the computers do the reconstruction of all the cells and then you have you move the the brains from a physical warehouse to a, a digital warehouse and um, it turns out that the slice of a human brain is about the same size as a as a semiconductor wafer you know about, about this big and so you can use the same machines that are used in the semiconductor industry to kind of move these slices around in a very um, parallel fashion the, the the trouble is is right now it's just so so expensive you know I, um, some some friends of mine have said they could do uh, a whole human brain at uh, cellular resolution but it would cost two million dollars just in the blades to to slice it because the blades would wear out and you have to keep replacing the blades so you know it's it's really a lot of engineering and kind of figuring out ways to make it cost effective to do this kind of thing you know mm -hmm. most people can't afford the two million dollars to just by blades, right on, right on. So, so now, now, if we in the future would be able to map out, and I would be able to download my my connectome. Um, so, so once again, like, what can I do with it? Like, um, okay, I, we could map it. The scientists could use that to study disease. But do you foresee, if we go a little bit further from that, uh, just to figure out how it works? Um, is there some kind of like application that we can use? Just like right now, uh, when I do map my 23andMe, I can see uh, my disease risk. Uh, that could mean that I could use that information to adjust my lifestyle so that I would maybe uh, reduce the risk for a specific uh, thing to occur. Um, or I could use the genetics together with blood work to verify if I have perhaps vitamin D uh, absorption problems or iron levels, uh, ferritin levels could be higher in my case. 
So I could be verifying that. And, and that could actually mean like practical changes in the way how I live. So if I had that picture of my brain, um, what can I do with it? Yeah, again, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I, when we when we discuss brain backups with people, oftentimes the question is, you know, what would I do with this this image of my brain? And um, and one of the answers I give is, you know, it's it's your brain. You can do whatever you like with it. And I think that it's it's a personal question. It's like it's you have your body. What do you do with your body? No one's going to tell you what to do with it. Um, so I guess one of the things that I personally first thought that was very interesting or useful was education. So you could image someone's connectome or brain before they went to college or graduate school and, and after, and then you could see, you know, what is it that they learned in, you know, chemical engineering or biological engineering or philosophy. And then you could um, maybe give someone else uh, that kind of education just by kind of merging the two connectomes. Hmm. Um, so I think education could be one. Um, you know, the, what happens when you merge two different connectomes that have different experiences and memories is an open question. No one's tried. It's it's really pretty out there scientifically or technologically. Um, I think another – someone here in New York um, told me that uh, maybe – a big application for business would be advertising. So um, maybe instead of going to uh, yeah, neuromarketing. scientists, right? So neuromarketing, you know, instead of if you had a, a neural modem that was uh, able to to imp imprint on somebody's brain that they wanted to buy Coca Cola, um, you know, that might be something that Coca Cola really cares about. So um, you could basically optimize for. Uh, uh, you, you could optimize your tools so that the brain would take what you want it to take, basically. So let's say the image of Coca-Cola and uh, the affection for it. Uh, so, so, so what what we are talking about here is the time time dimension. So seeing changes in the brain over time. So let's say I could imagine that if I have a scan and then I change drastically the way how I learn. So let's say from reading books to uh, trying to more like orate uh, the topics or practically or physically experience in them and then like mapping my brain afterwards I could maybe make a comparison if, if that is um, more effective on, on the connectome level to induce change. Another idea that comes to my mind mind is uh, things related to neuroplasticity uh, so I could be, could be looking at if I'm uh, inducing um, a change where I would have more resources, uh, specific parts of the brain taking over. Uh, let's say if I'm becoming partly blind or, or whatever, and my, might be using different kind of uh, uh, feedback loops to um, enable my body to um, experience vision again through, through se different sensory inputs. Um, I could optimize for that. Um, so, so there's probably many applications that we can then get into once we have the time dimension and you could have like several snapshots of your brain uh, not to even mention like a real-time picture over time which is I mean healthcare right now is snapshots you're born we take a snapshot of you you get a disease we take a snapshot of you and uh, what really matters is uh, uh, the, the change uh, that we are inducing and then mapping again and see if we if we made a change now if we had a real-time picture of what is going on then that would enable a feedback loop through which we could optimize a hell of a lot of different processes uh, in, in the way how the organism is interacting with its environment. Is that right? Yeah, indeed. Um, I think that one of the, the first things that people think of when they think about optimizing uh, the brain is, you know, become smarter, uh, get a better memory. Um, and so, indeed, that's that's kind of what Kernel, this, this startup I mentioned that's doing the the neural implant is is interested in is they want to uh, they want to augment memory and you know the CPU optimizes you know how people do what they do and, and allows this faster iteration loop you know instead of taking uh, written tests with a pen and paper maybe you could just you read someone's brain and you see whether they learned it already um, 
yeah, I, I guess one other business application that I think has been uh, somewhat interesting is kind of the, the personal assistant um, thing. So, you know, if you've ever had an employee or a coworker, um, sort of the knowledge transfer that allows them to do their job is something that's often very time consuming. And so if you could use the, uh, the connectome or the brain image to kind of um, allow this training process to occur faster, either of a, a virtual assistant or of a person, then this would be something that would really be advantageous for um, for a personal assistant, or you might call them like a minion or something, you could have a robot that, hmm. you know, instead of, if you could train them much more quickly by just, you know, instantly training them as to what they're supposed to do in their, their task. Well, uh, I think we have to close soon, but I, I want to ask one more question. Uh, and that would be, now if we have a copy of the connectome, does it have all the information that we could theoretically boot up the brain in a, in a digital simulation and I could run a replica of myself in the digital world? And I mean, would it, ha would it be conscious, <laughs> etc.? cetera? So, so, so I guess we have to simulate a lot of other things uh, in, on top of Connectome to, to enable uh, an avatar to emerge in a digital realm. Um. I believe that consciousness is kind of a scare word. Um, it's used to kind of represent, you know, all kinds of things that people uh, interpret as, you know, another human around them. If, if you break down consciousness into other things, like being able to make decisions, being able to recognize patterns and all kinds of things, it, it seems like consciousness is, is actually broken, relatively it can be broken down into these different parts that when analyzed separately um, are are more accessible. Um, so I think that uh, that the computation that's required to to simulate the whole human brain is immense. Um, it's certainly more than any computer on the planet right now can accomplish. But um, that doesn't mean that it won't be possible in the future. Um, you know, the the basic equations of neuron firing are are well known. It's just a I think it's joining it with the new data that's coming from the Connectome projects or the Brain Initiative or or other um, companies that will make it more useful. Right. Are are we living in a simulation? I mean, there is now a huge like uh, kind of trend in Silicon Valley among the technology elite uh, with the idea that because of laws, laws of nature are following so so uh, uh, detailed kind of algorithms um, that it could be as well possible that we are kind of being simulated and, and all of these these different connections and everything that we can map out it's just like someone programmed this and uh, that we as we map out these things and create a digital replica and we are working on virtual reality augmented reality uh, mixed reality interfaces uh, with artificial intelligence that um, we, we ourselves could give birth uh, to a simulation. And uh, uh, so, so do, you, do you believe in, in that kind of uh, stuff? I guess as a scientist and a, a physicist, I, I don't, I wouldn't believe in something unless I had proof or evidence that that was indeed the case. Um, you know, to say that because we, um, we can't find evidence that we're in a simulation, means that we could just be in a really good simulation is nonsensical to me. I mean, if someone could point to some piece of evidence that, that says, you know, because of this or that or in a simulation, sure, you know, I would take that um, for what it is as a piece of evidence. Um, I think also as a scientist, um, you know, I think personally it, it seemed reasonable to me to think that if you keep measuring the world around you in new and different ways and, and it it's self-consistent in all these different ways that you measure it, that, you know, the probability of it being a simulation and when you test it over and over again in all these different ways and um, is minuscule. And so, no, I do not believe we're living in a simulation. I have no evidence for that. Right on. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to note that there are uh, some of these very wealthy people are now funding scientists to break us out from simulation. We'll see if they will succeed. Um, but at, at this stage, we are still mapping out, figuring out things. Uh, what intrigues me is also in, in, in physics, there is the observer effect and the way how we are 
actually making things appear once we observe them, once we measure them, and how we are also with our instruments and, and uh, ways of looking at things, we are uh, also influencing what we are observing. So it's kind of quantum dimension uh, to, to these things. It's, it's also an uh, extremely fascinating topic, and, and we'll see where we're getting, but definitely I see that there's going to be just with like with artificial intelligence, probably broad AI is still far away, way, but the narrow applications will be phenomenal and probably the narrow applications of connectome will also be phenomenal for uh, mapping out and understanding disease at the resolution that was not possible before and would probably also uh, invalidate a lot of science that has been done about the brain. Uh, I remember reading that in the 80s, etc., when the imaging technologies were were um, uh, taking leaps, uh, many of the a lot of the research and the theories we had of the brain uh, changed uh, drastically. That we, we we had to have a completely new view of what's going on. And uh, do you foresee that that this um, technology would develop a full understanding of the connectome? We'll be able to mapping that out. That there would be a like a paradigm shift, almost like a, a leap in our understanding of the brain that seems to be a black box as we speak. I, I don't I don't think it will be a paradigm shift. I think it will be a very slow and gradual process that will, you know, little pieces will crack away one by one. Um, and I think that uh, I think it will be a big business as well. I think that, you know, many companies have, you know, trillions. There was a study that showed that, you know, a trillion dollars had been pumped into the economy through the human uh, brain, through the, the human genome project, you know, that so many, and, and health has improved so dramatically as well. So, you know, there's, um, there's money to be made in improving people's health. And the, I think that, you know, the mapping the connectome um, will be um, a huge area for business as well as science and, and for people's um, day to day to day lives. I mean, totally. Yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, Professor Russell Hansen will be speaking at the Biohacker Summit in Helsinki on 18th of November, and uh, we will be diving deeper into the brain and connectome. And there is also Dr. Uh, Julia Shaw coming along, who has been looking at memory and how it functions and and how it changes um, as we as we retrieve memories and, and how it might be an illusion. So you mo if you're listening to this, you might want to check it out. Uh, but, but for now, thank you so much, Professor, and uh, looking forward to a breakthrough in the work that you do and also seeing you in Finland soon. Yeah, thank you. It's been great to chat, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, coming to Finland. So finally, uh, if people want to learn more about what you're doing and want to read more, educate themselves more, where should they go? What what should they look for? What books, uh, websites, uh, etc. They should go after. Uh, there are so many. Um, I mean, I you might look at uh, the the Allen Brain Institute um, has a, a very immense website um, that has this. For instance, the map of the uh, um, the thirty year old woman, where you can zoom in on every single cell in a, an adult human brain. I, uh, is, it's pretty fascinating. Um, if you look for the Brain Initiative as well, the NIH, the um, here in the US, um, has many many resources. There, there are so many. It's hard to say. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Biacris podcast. Uh, my name is Dave Martin. Over and out. And see you next time. All right. Bye bye.